My introduction I entitled The Defeatist Deity of Chaotic Cosmology. The Defeatist Deity of Chaotic Cosmology. I was flexing my Baptist alliteration muscles there yet again. But there's a reason why I phrased it this way, and it wasn't just for memory retention, although that is indeed part of it. By the way, the word cosmology, if that's not a word you're used to seeing, don't feel bad, and none of us really are. It's just another one of those million-dollar words that means the study of how everything came to be, the universe and all that is contained therein. And I mentioned the defeatist deity of chaotic cosmology, this idea that everything came into being as a result of a random process of explosions and the Big Bang, and all of a sudden now we're all here to make this point. And asking you to recall, if you were with us last week, my message from last week, when I mentioned the scientist Carl Sagan, the late Carl Sagan, in the beginning of his PBS, I think it was a PBS produced production, which is kind of redundant, but you know what I mean, called Cosmos, in which he began by saying, The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. And I said that if Sagan was right in saying this, then there are a number of things that would also be true by implication stemming from this materialistic statement. And by materialistic, I'm not just saying, you know, we're material people living in a material world, to quote one pop star from the 80s, probably shouldn't do that. But the reason why I say materialistic is in reference to a philosophical way of thinking that says all we can be sure of that actually exists is that which we can experience through our sense perception, our five senses to be specific. But if that's true, then I made this point last week, then the following would be true. Number one, that there is no ultimate purpose for why anything would exist. In other words, we're all just kind of happy little accidents, unplanned products of the universe's crudely unintelligent conception. Number two, there's no ultimate justification to be overly concerned with issues related to meaning, morality, or anything metaphysical. Metaphysical just meaning beyond our physical world. Foundations for morality and ethics and logic and the rest. And so therefore, thirdly, there is no ultimate reason why any of us, quite frankly, ought to continue living. Especially if by dying we might decrease the surplus population, as one Ebenezer Scrooge said. So we all ought to consider dying in order to promote the health and continuous of the mother, right? Mother Earth. Since this is the only meaning we'd possibly be able to mine in Sagan's ultimately nihilistic outlook. Another big word, nihilistic, meaning nihilism, the philosophical worldview that there is no grand meaning to anything that exists or that has existence. Nihilism coming from the Greek word nihilo or nihil, meaning nothing, literally. And most nihilists that I know don't actually think that nothing matters, but that is the out that, that is the logical conclusion of their worldview. That at the end of the day, nothing really matters at all. And so it's this kind of self-contradictory conclusion human beings establishing a reason for living when we really have no understanding of the reason why we are or even should continue living is showcased nicely in the lyrics of a song. You know, I grew up, as some of you might have had, as, a, as like a punk rock kind of guy, down with the government anarchy, yeah, you know. And in one of those bands, this was a, this, this was a group of lyrics that I heard quite often. And I'm mentioning one song here that I listened to frequently when I was a kid where the song states in one section, it's the only world we've got. Let's protect it while we can. It's all there is, and there ain't no more. This type of view makes even the most bleak blush in the cheeks. But it is the logical conclusion, as I mentioned, of such an illogical and dark assertion, meant to be a proclamation concerning the beauty of the created order, but then denies the very order that must have precluded it in order for it to have come into being to begin with. So in collision with this view last week, we examined the first two verses of John's prologue, this power-packed first 18 verses of John's gospel. And in doing so, we saw four characteristics about the Word of God that give us the foundation for a cosmology not rooted in hopeless self-contradiction and, quite frankly, idolatry, but one that is rooted in the grand designer 
of all that is or ever will be. And that is not the cosmos, but the Word of God Himself, who is, by way of review, number one, eternally existent before the universe. He doesn't have a beginning. He always has been, and He always will be. Number two, that this Word is eternally attendant with God Himself. He was with God at the beginning, and by His activity, all things came into being. Thirdly, that He is eternally existent as God Himself. If you go back to verse 1, the begin, the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, but not just that, the Word was God. And He is to this day. And fourth, that this Word is therefore eternally anchored by God Himself, where it says, He was in the beginning with God. So I desire to build on this prior message this morning by providing an additional five characteristics five characteristics of the Word seen in His creative activity and life-affirming illumination. Now, if you look at your notes, you'll see creative activity and life-affirming illumination. Those are your two main headings, and the five characteristics kind of fill in from there underneath those two main headings. And I hope to do this with you, seeing how the Word of God slams the door shut on even considering the nihilistic outlook of a Carl Sagan to God's glory and our ultimate and truly everlasting blessing. So, once again, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. The Word is indeed Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the Son of God, our only Savior. And as we go through this section, I urge you to keep these things in mind. Number one, I want you to meditate on the magnificence that is the Messiah. Meditate on his magnificence. There is a lot of sanctification that can happen right there at that moment. If we would but grasp the full extent of his majesty, that in of itself in the heart of every twice-born believer in this room ought to be the rudimentary materials that the Spirit of God uses to drive our thoughts away from being focused on the things of this world. But as Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, to set our mind on heavenly places where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, providing the proper fuel to mortify, go with the old King James, to mortify our members on the earth, or to say in common vernacular today, to kill sin in our very bodies. You want the strength and power to kill sin? Meditate on the magnificence of the Messiah. That's a good place to start. Secondly, I want you to stoop low in your soul and contemplate the suffering of this singularly sufficient Savior in light of this text. That even though he was in the beginning with God and was very God of very God, made himself of no reputation and entered into our experience to be the illumination of our lives. If he did not do that, we would have no hope, and we would still be groping about in the darkness. And then thirdly, I want you to linger long in the light of these letters on these sacred pages, like a newlywed bride who wants just five more minutes with her groom. Just give me a little bit more time with Jesus from this passage and really allow yourself to bask in its glow and the warmth it should provide for us as those whom God from eternity past has chosen to save, despite our best efforts to damn us for all eternity. So I ask you to stand as you're able for the reading of God's word this morning. John chapter one, we're just gonna do verses one through five again. John chapter one, verses one through five where John opens up, I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. Lord, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word, 
and that you would enable this weak preacher to present the passage in its proper context and how you meant to deliver it to the original audience and that those in attendance this morning and watching later would be able to make application through the Spirit of God illuminating the text for all of our benefits here and at home and, and wherever else this may be viewed. And we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. And may God bless the reading of his word continuously. So as I mentioned at the outset, the first heading here, I want to focus on the words creative activity. And looking ahead here, it looks like two of the five characteristics of this word of God are located in, these, in this first verse here. So let's look at the first characteristic. Number one, the word of God is the originator of existence, or as the kids like to say, he's the OG. Sorry, I'll never do that again. Anyway, <laughs> and by the way, underneath my heading, I have in, I have in, ital in italics, what am I talking about? Qu quotation marks. That's my translation, okay? So I provided that for you here. If it's underlined, that means it's been emphasized. If it's bolded, that means it's been doubly emphasized. And emphasis can be for different reasons, changing subjects, but double emphasis is to really draw our attention to it, as it would have done for John's original readers. So we see here, all things came into being through him. Now, some translations, and the translation you may have here today, may read something like, all things were made through him. I think, I think the ESV has it. That way. So you have an ESV in front of you there. I think it says all things were made through him. One translation, the New Living, which is almost more of a paraphrase than a translation, and I do like the way the New Living renders certain things, but you got to tread lightly with that particular version of God's Word. As the NLT goes so far as to say, God created everything through him, even though the word God doesn't actually occur in this verse. And so they're taking translational license to help us understand what the original author is trying to convey. But I do have to take slight umbrage with that because I think the New Living Translation runs the risk of turning the word into a merely passive instrument, much like the laptop I use to type up these notes or I type my emails or anything of that nature that you yourselves use in everyday life. And I think that can lead to grave errors. For instance, I mentioned the Jehovah Witness concept last week, that the word was not God, but that he is a God. And we, I tried to tear that down. And, and some people told me it was, yeah, that was really heavy. I had to listen to that a couple of times. I do apologize for that. Uh, but it is, it, it is one of those things that, you know, when the Jehovah Witnesses come to our door and they start knocking, you know, we could be equipped to deal with and be used of God to bear gospel witness instead of, as I said last week, acting like we're just part of the furniture and hope they go away. Um, I don't want them to go away. I want them to come to my house. And if you, they ever do go to your house, say, hey, my pastor would love to talk to you sometime. Let me get you. His Actually, can I get your number? He'll give you a call. And then they'll probably say, see ya. So it can lead to grave errors. The, like the Jehovah Witness concept of the word being the highest created being of Yahweh, right? God created everything through the highest created being of his, who is the word. And of course, that's wrong. As I was just talking with Brother Bill right before the message today, you know, when it says, without him, nothing was made that has been made. Well, that kind of means that the word has to pre-exist everything that was made, doesn't it? You're contradicting yourself. But I digress. The word is Yahweh himself. He's the one through whom all things are created. But he's not a created being himself. And I fear that the NLT leaves the door open for that. Therefore, I think a more accurate translation is the one I've provided. Or if you have a New American Standard or a Legacy Standard, I think that's good. All things came into being through him. That's the actual original Greek verb, to come into being. So what does that mean then? The word is the active agent of creation and the one through whom literally everything, that's the word there, the Greek word there, we see all things, guess what it means, guys? All things, right? All things exist in the created order and have come into being through the word of God himself, who is himself uncreated. And I have, a, I have my own take and a paraphrase underneath that in your notes, and I put it this way, quote, everything, everything that is in the created order owes its existence to him since it came to be through his creative activity. So what are the implications of this? Well, I think we have here just in this first part of verse three, the words sovereign providence, allowance, and ordination. Wow, that's a lot. Got that all out of anniversary? Well, yeah, I think so, and I think we all can, by implication of what's actually being taught here. Note, his all-encompassing 
creation, right? Recall Genesis 1-3. God speaks his word, and then his word creates. The word working in complete concert with God. You have God the Father there in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1-1. You have the word when he speaks, let there be light. And don't forget, the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, is hovering over the waters in Genesis 1-2 as God initially spoke the heavens and earth into existence. And in that first chapter of Genesis, that pattern repeats all the way down through, as I mentioned last week. So in every instance, God speaks by divine fiat, and then creation follows. So if there's any kind of nihilo going on in this world, it's the nihilo before everything was created, because that's what God created everything out of. No pre-existing materials. He created everything that there is ex nihilo. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that we see today, including us, is a, a this, this like God specially created for the first time us. He created our first parents, and then that has continued on from generation to generation to generation. But he is the source and the origination of anything that exists. Anything and everything. Once again, the word of God being who? Well, it's spoiler alert, right? It's Jesus. Jesus is the source of everything that there is. He's not just the savior of the world. He's the source of it. And we're going to see that here in a few moments as you look to another passage. So this is something only God can do. And in fact, in Genesis 1.1, the Hebrew verb used, bara, speaks of God's special creation. It's only ever used of God in the entire Hebrew Bible. And here John applies it, I believe, to the word. And he does this with maximal care. Every single jot and tittle has been properly crafted and set in place by the Word of God Himself. Like a master artist who attends each painstaking stroke of his brush with maximal care and intentionality, he also cares to make sure that his masterpiece is properly protected, marking it with his signature, highlighting his mastery over his creation. So with this word, who is providentially sovereign over everything that has ever been or ever will be, we could term this his providentially sovereign care and control. In other words, he didn't just make this world and then leave it to its own devices. No, this is his own handiwork. This is Jesus's, the word of God's own handiwork. And he stamps it with his own signature even in us as image bearers of God. And so he's providentially sovereign in care and control of the entire created order. And so when we talk about these words providential, what do we mean by that? Well, providential is in reference to God's overriding determination and direction over whatsoever comes to pass for his ultimately glorious purposes. Now, for some of us, that causes maybe a fair amount of hand-wringing and fear, because does that mean that God himself is the creator of evil? That God himself is the source of the wars that we see even in our present day or the strife we have in our families or our places of business? We can definitely say the word of God gives us an emphatic no on that point. He is not the source of those things, but is he the creator and providentially in control of those things, and ordains that those things would come to pass in order to bring about his maximal amount of glory in the created order? Yes. There is not one bit of meaningless evil that takes place in this world that he doesn't have a plan and purpose for. And he himself is not the source of it. And look, we just need to bow at the the mystery of that. Because I, I can't fully understand that. I know the Bible teaches me, though, that God is not the author of evil. But he also teaches me that he's sovereign, that God's command over absolutely everything in the created order, whether seen or unseen, is within his providential power. So that those things that are good and those things that would be corrupted to evil are both under his authority. You want an example of this, a biblical example? The story of Joseph. Genesis 50, verse 19 to 21. When Joseph's brothers are cowering because they think now that dad's dead, he's going to have his way with us in Egypt. They're not even in the land that they were living in. 
And Joseph says, am I in the place of God? He said, what you meant for evil, what you meant for evil, God didn't just say, well, I can do something with this. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And so therefore, nothing takes him by surprise, including, and I'm going to say this with, with all care that I can, the evil that you yourself have faced in your own lives, whether due to negligent or abusive parents, negligent or abusive teachers, negligent or abusive pastors, God has been in control the entire time and has brought you to the place of sovereign grace. So due to his providential sovereignty, everything that ever has or was, has been or ever will be serves his ultimate purposes. Even the devil himself serves the purposes of the Almighty. There is coming a time in which he will be bound for a thousand years. But we can say now, even though he may be referred to as the prince of the power of the air, the one who's working actively in the sons of disobedience, blinding the minds of those who believe not, he's called the God of this age, he is not in control. He's on a leash. God's got him on a leash, and God uses him to bring about his glorious purposes. You gotta believe that. That's the antidote for the nihilism, right? For the nothingness. That even though I have gone through pain and torment, and let's face it, we've even been harbingers of pain and torment in other people's lives. God still has a purpose for that. He's not the source of that evil, but he is the source of whatsoever comes to pass, for he ordains whatsoever comes to pass. It's part of his omnipotently, omnipotently, his, his, his all-powerful performed purposes. In allowance, God permits events to take place within his creation under his sovereign control, ultimately under his ordination. That God actively exercises his sovereign control to bring about all of his purposes. So whether it's by allowance or by ordination, which overrides all of it, he is the ultimate agent of all creation, and nothing happens without his say-so. If you want another biblical example of this, I need to look no further than the Apostle Judas. In Matthew 26, 24, I got my cheetah ribbon, so I'll make it quick. Matthew 26, 24. Notice what Jesus says about his betrayer. It says, the son of man is going just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. So Judas was still God's Judas, and God used that traitor to bring about the salvation of the nations. And yet he himself went to the place that was prescribed for him. So much so that Jesus even said of him, and you can almost hear the fear in the Son of Man's voice, it would be better if that one had not even been born. Even he served God's purposes, which is why Jesus could say to him later, even in this gospel, friend, what you're going to do, go do it quickly. So once again, just to kind of highlight this, this includes each and every trial you have faced, are facing now, or will face in the future. The word never takes a mulligan. Give me a do-over, right? Let me try that putt one more time. He's never caught off guard by whatsoever comes to pass. This is a completely reliable God that we serve whom no one is before and to whom no one is ever beholden, which means not only is he the originator of existence, but the second characteristic, he is the exclusive originator of existence. Remember, John is repetitive in his style. It's part of his nature, it seems. You look down at verses 8 and 9. He says, he was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. Speaking about John, there was the true light. And you'll see these kinds of repetitive, uh, repetitious ways in which John speaks. But unlike an absent-minded preacher, John isn't repeating things because he forgot or because he's just trying to fill time. Rather, John repeats to draw emphasis, settling the debate. Without him, and I have it emphasized there in my translation because I think it's accurate, and without him, not even one thing, not even one thing had come into being of that which has come into being. 
As the late, great Dr. R.C. Sproul said, there's not a maverick molecule out there in the universe of which he is not in control. Or as was mentioned in the conference, the Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper, who said, and I'm paraphrasing, there isn't one thing in, the inch, in, in, in any square inch of all of creation that Christ does not cry over it, mine. He's the origin of it, the exclusive origin of it. Thus the emphasis on without him, not without God here, but without the word, nothing, absolutely nothing exists of that which actually exists and we can say by implication, therefore then comes to pass. Even the world of vain imagination, right? When, when men imagine vainly gods to suit themselves and, and, and sinners imagine schemes in order to go and get their fill of, of, of their, satiate their lusts, we might say. Even that mind, even though God's not the source of the evil that that mind conceives, he alone is the source of the mind that chooses to imagine vainly. And so he's still in control. He's still on the throne. The word's ultimate control over all that is, that's a pretty good implication of this. The word isn't the only agent by which everything presently was created in respect to the entire triune nature of God, but nothing will ever exist outside of his creative will from the beginning. And this is in concert with the entire triune nature of God. This tells us what? A couple of things. Number one, that creation is limited. Creation is limited. It has a terminus. It's not going to stretch on forever into infinity. The universe isn't everlasting. It may appear that way to us, especially when you look out in the blackness of the night sky and you wonder, like, what's beyond that tiny star, which is probably billions of Earths in size, but it looks like just a little dot in a black cloth. Creation is limited. And limited, here's the thing. It's not limited because God made it to be limited and then said, oh, I guess that's as far as I made it. That's all I got done. No, it's limited by the word himself. He set the marks for it. Anything in creation is completely contingent upon him. Nothing can ever be brought into being that could challenge the word and in any way place him in a category of limitation. The only limitation, we could say, that is true of the word is that which he is bound to by his nature, since he cannot contradict this nature and continue to share in the being of God. The creation that is dependent on him, in other words, cannot limit him in any way. So if you've ever gotten this question before, you know, usually by you know, an atheist or atheistic-minded person trying to smart off to the college professor, well, usually not to the professor because they're usually on their side, but maybe to somebody who might be sitting in class who claims to be a Christian, who has got the courage to actually stand up and say, I believe in Jesus in the middle of your existentialism and phenomenology class and whatever. Point is, they'll say, well, can God create a rock so big, so heavy that he can't lift it if he's all powerful? No, that's nonsense. Omnipotence cannot be outdone and undone in any way. If God create a, could create a rock that's heavier than him, then I guess he's not God, is he? We need to not allow an unbelieving world to force us into their word games to try to play tricks on us, to cause us to make concessions about what we believe about God that the word doesn't tell us. And if somebody says, well, you're limiting God, you know I'm not. He's limitless. You're just asking him to do something stupid. Our God is not stupid. He's not nonsensical. <laughs> you, the verdict is out. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so creation is limited. And secondly, creation is in his control. All right? Creation is in his control. As I already mentioned, the least atom to the greatest anomaly, everything in creation owes its existence to the word himself. I'm going to read this to you from Colossians chapter 1. I want you to think about this. Colossians 1, verses 16 to 17. I'm going to emphasize how often this is said, okay? Just to show you that Paul agrees with John. Some people try to, like, drive a wedge in the canon of Scripture and try to say, like, well, the Bible disagrees in so many places with itself. No, it doesn't. And here's one place where it most clearly doesn't. Colossians 1, 16 to 17. For by him, now we're talking about Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, which, by the way, firstborn does not mean first created. It just means preeminent one, and that's a whole other sermon we're not going to get into. I've already got like five going here at this point, probably. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Do you hear that, President Biden? Do you hear that, President Xi? Do you hear that, Yahya Sinwar? Do you hear that, King Jong-un? All of you dictators, all of you presidents, your throne and your dominion exists because he exists and he's allowing you to be in that position and he's going to hold you accountable for the way you're abusing it. All things, thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things were created through him. And get this, this is beautiful. All things not only were created through him, but also for him. They were created for the glory of Jesus Christ. And can you think, I'm going off here, but can you think of a more deserving recipient who left the gaze of myriads of angels and the praises of myriads of heavenly hosts and took upon himself, added to his divine nature, a limited human form to bear upon the cross of shame, all of our guilt, all of our sin, for all of God's people, wherever they may be, at whatever time they may live. He deserves it. He deserves it. Muhammad doesn't deserve it. The Buddha doesn't deserve it. The Pope doesn't deserve it. The priests don't deserve it. The rabbis don't deserve it. Nobody deserves it. Nobody has done what my Jesus has done. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. Why, why would we doubt his mastery? What grave sin, honestly, and we're guilty of this. What grave sin to forget Jesus and his authority over everything that exists. Let's move on to the second set of characteristics, and I'll try to move through this perhaps a bit quicker. We have the words life-affirming illumination. So we're moving from the words creative activity. We looked at his eternality last week. Now we're looking at the words life-affirming illumination. Oh, why do I say it that way? Well, let's look at the text again. Verse 4 begins with, in him. In him, emphasize, to remind you, who are we talking about? We're talking about the word. And in the word was life, was life. And by the way, we have another one of these imperfect verbs here, just like last week. So the best way to understand this is, and a time immemorial from the past, in him was life. In other words, life has always been in him. What is life, you might ask? What's it like to live? You remember that old saying people would say, Oh, well, maybe, maybe it's not that old. Like in the 80s. I remember hearing in the 80s, people say, get a life. You know, go get a, why don't you get a life? <laughs> you know, what are you all worried about that for? Go get a life. Huh? <laughs> it's like, well, what is life? Right? What is life? Is life just living and dying? Is it just, you know, trying to finish the race with the most amount of stuff, the greatest portfolio? accolades and praises from people that'll just forget you in five minutes when you're dead. But don't worry, they want that stereo. I mean, what does it matter? What is life? Who defines what life is and what life is worth living? Well, in him was life. And if he is the definition of life itself, then I want to know about that. I want to know what it means and why it matters. Not only is Jesus the bringer of life, but he himself generates life by just being who he is. In other words, he can't help but be the generator of life. It's part of his nature. Thus, he is the only one who can not only bring about death, the cessation of the generation of life, but can and also has conquered it. And by the way, as if I could say this, it is no gospel at all if it doesn't include both why he brought death and how he defeated death. If anyone comes to you preaching a gospel of health and wealth and prosperity, never talking about sin, never talking about the righteous wrath of God, you know, our God is a wrathful God. You know, the Puritans and people from time past that were far more devoted in making sure every last thought they had magnified Jesus, referred to him as the awful God or the terrible God. We hear awful and terrible, and we think those are awful and terrible things. But God is awful 
And he is terrible in the sense that he's angry with sin. He hates sin. How do I know he hates sin? Because it took God from eternity, taking on a human form, to be punished on my behalf. He hates sin. And that God would give us a greater vision and a hatred of sin ourselves. That when we hear and sing songs about the cross of Christ, that we wouldn't do it and say, oh, I remember this tune as we're chomping a piece of gum. Oh yeah, that's a good one. But that it would strike us down in light of what God went through on our behalf. A gospel that does not have the reason for why the death, why death had to come from the originator of life is not a gospel. And it's also not a gospel if it doesn't talk about how he defeated that death. Because a Savior who just dies for your sins and stays in the grave has no power to save. But a Savior who dies from sins and rises from the grave, raising up sons and daughters to God, that's a God who's all-powerful. That's a gospel. That's a gospel. So we have the words life-giving nature. Death and all that which is promoted by death is the complete antithesis, the opposite to God's life-giving being and life-affirming character. So what does it mean to die then? Well, to die means to cease receiving the life-giving, life-sustaining presence and sustenance of the self-sufficient Word Almighty. It's not like we're taught completely. If you went to public school, we say, oh, death's just a part of the cycle of life. Things die. But why do they die? And why do people spend millions of dollars to try to escape it? You see all the Anytime Fitnesses, and you see all the tanning salons and the, you know, the beautification centers. Our country, I mean, they're legion. We're constantly trying to outrun that thing that's staring us right in the face. It's death. It's not part of the way things ought to be, and it's within the control of the Almighty. So we think about death-centric being versus life-centric being on this point. What is death-centric being? Death-centric being promotes everything that rejects God's life-giving nature and embraces the ultimate goal of nihilism, which is, you know, they go around once, right? Go for the gusto. It's the only world we got. Let's protect it while we still can. That's all there is, and there ain't no more. That's a death-centric culture, and that's death-centric being. It's self-contradictory, too, because it relies upon life-sustaining existence to prop up its positions. So we'll talk about things like affirming marriage, right, or same-sex marriage, which can't produce life, quite frankly. And based on people who study diseases, it seems more prone to produce death. But that'll probably get me canceled on YouTube. So maybe you might want to download this before they kick it off uh, when you get it. Or to use another modern example, hiding behind human shields while promoting a life of liberation in places like Gaza. We should be able to see through this kind of stuff. That's not life. That's a celebration of death. And on that second point, I know because their leaders will say, we love death more than they love life. And yet they'll say we're doing this for humanity's sake. If you doubt it, go look up Hamas's charter. You'll see it for yourself. But what's life-centric being? Life-centric being seeks to fall, and this is what it is. Okay, guys, so what's life? Life-centric being, or true life, seeks to fall into conformity, not with the ways of this death-glorifying world, but to stay connected to the vine, right? Stay connected to the vine, John 15, 5, in the way he has brought about life, seeking to promote those things that magnify the life-giving Son of God, renouncing one's natural affinity with death, which is due to the curse of sin in our bodies and upon our souls, and seeking to champion it in every way possible until he returns to the end, to end the reign of death. Another song that I like says, there's going to be a time coming in the future. that says, without a single shot shot or a single bomb dropped, the killing machine will forever stop. And all the world will know the name of the Prince of Peace. That's not going to come through the Abraham Accords as much as I wish those things would bring about some more peace in our world. True peace is only going to come about when God makes peace with his enemies. And that's something that his sovereign grace does alone. 
If your embrace of the gospel has not resulted in an embrace of this life-centric being to some degree, then I fear for you that you may still be still born, or but better yet, still unborn again. Fourthly, Jesus is the illuminator. The word is the illuminator of humanity. Look at verse four going on again. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Now he emphasizes life here again, perhaps to draw out the emphasis that the word doesn't only generate and then leave in the dark, as I've already said, but illuminates. He reveals what's true in his creation and points back to him at the source, regardless of whether or not we reject it. All humanity, get this, all humanity. Your unbelieving uncle that always wants to argue about why you should vote Democrat and, 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 you know, and, and be more open-minded, for instance. All humanity has been illumined by the creator, beginning with the fact that we have been created, being created what? Imago Dei, in the image of God. Verse 9 of chapter 1, there was the true light, which coming to the word, what does he do? He enlightens everyone. He enlightens everyone, which then causes us to ask the question, so does that mean he saves everybody? What does this mean? You know, John uses these motifs of light and darkness a lot. And we also know that John can use things as kind of a play on words to mean two things by saying the one phrase. So let's unpack this a little bit more. This life not only grants and sustains life, but he also enlightens life, shining his signifying spotlight upon everything that he has made. So what are the implications? Well, the word enlightens and witness to God. Every human being sitting in here, watching later out there on the street, every human being has an intrinsic knowledge of God, which is expressed every time he acts, thinks, and speaks in ways that betray his true derivative nature. Like when he says things like, there is no God. And if there was a God, I'm sure mad that he's not doing something about all this evil in the world. Well, you can't have it both ways. Do you not believe he exists, or do you just think he's mean? Because you can't have your cake and eat it too. Choose. And by the way, when you choose, you're only demonstrating once again that there is a God who has given you the desire to even care about these things. Last time I checked, I didn't see deer or sheep joining philosophical groups to try to question why they live and why the hunters are always trying to shoot us dead. They don't do that. Why don't they do that? Because they're not made in the image of God. So this is seen a few different ways. This enlightening and witness to God. Two ways are true of us in our unredeemed state. First, we have the unconscious deism. Deism just means a belief in a God, an almighty God. Not a personal God, it's just an almighty God. This is the state of every man when he comes into the world. And by man, you, I hope ladies in here know I, I mean that in a general sense. Humanity, right? All mankind. Although John will later refer to this word as the light of the world in John chapter 8, verse 12, and that's clearly in the context of salvation, because he grants the light of life to all who follow him in obedient faith. Here, the light is spoken of as enlightening everybody. Therefore, this revelation of the word to come at a later date is rooted in him enlightening the minds of mankind to his existence, with mankind owing their lives to him in a very real and never-ending way. This is the nature of all of us, regardless of who we are, an unconscious deism. That does not mean that we are okay with our creator. We are alienated from him due to wicked works. We are separate from him because of our allegiance to our federal head, who is Adam. But yet, we know he exists. Intrinsically, we know he exists. We have to use our image of God in order to even do anything in this world. So we bear witness to it in that way. But secondly, we do have, we go from unconscious deism to conscious atheism. This is when the state of every purposefully rebellious man comes into full fruit. That's why Psalm 14 states, if you ever want to see an example of this, read Psalm 14. Psalm 14, 1a says what? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Not that the fool is convinced there is no God, but he says, I don't have to be concerned about these things. As far as I'm concerned, practically speaking, God adds nothing to my life just complicates things. There's no God. Why be bothered about it? And that leads to the actions of the wicked in Psalm 14, 1 to 3, and a rejection of God's promised salvation in verses 4 through 7. But moving ahead for the sake of time, we then come to third, the true theism. And this is only true of those who are the twice-born men and women, even in this room. 
John's customary play on words approach to gospel communication is evident in the way he describes this here, meaning that he intends more than just intellectual enlightenment for his sheep, but true spiritual life as well. As it says in Psalm 36, 9, for with you, O God, is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. So in other words, you need not ever fear, Christian, in this room or at home, to bear witness to Christ. The truth is on your side. The fact that the unbelieving world, just like you did, still thinks and reasons and desires things beyond just putting food in their stomach and a roof over their head demonstrates that they've been made in the image of God. The truth is on your side. The word of God illumines their eyes to show them their true nature. Even though they may try to bury it down in their deadness of sin and rebellion, they cannot escape it. And neither could you, right? You couldn't escape it. If you're a true believer, you couldn't escape that. Eventually, God brought you to finally throw down your arms, bow before the foot of the cross, and say, I surrender. Have your way with me. I trust in you and you alone. Isn't that a beautiful day? What a beautiful day. The truth is on your side. However, the witness is to be born. And they may not admit it outwardly, but they know in their heart of hearts that this is the truth, that he is the light that illumines everyone. Don't give up. Don't back down. Expect opposition. It's going to come. For this is our lot as strangers and exiles in this world. Like somebody who's been sleeping all night and the light suddenly hits their eyes. Oh, that hurts. What are you doing? I turn that off. I want five more minutes. Right? Well, that's the way the unbelieving world is. Just give, me, just give me a few more years. How many people have you talked to who have said things like that? In fact, Brother Costi again over the weekend gave us an example from his own life where he was witnessing to a guy and a guy said, I know what you're saying is true. But he's still an unbeliever. Why are you still an unbeliever? I'm just not ready yet. I've got too I know, I know that if I, if, if I come to Christ and the things that I want to do or have to do, I'm not going to be able to do anymore. Something's going to change. I've talked to people like that. Some of you have talked to people like that. Maybe you're one of those people. I don't know. Who are like, man, what that blowhard is saying up there, that's, that's true. I believe, I, I, I know it's true, but I just, I love my sin too much. That's what it is, right? It's not the intellectual thing. It's not the atheism thing. That's a smoke screen. What you really want is you want to do what you want to do with your life. Just admit it. Admit it. Admit that you want to live your own life and you don't want anybody to tell you what to do. You know? We were all that way. And quite frankly, as believers, we can still fall into those pits, can't we? That's why we need these reminders of who the Word of God is. And finally, we have the dispeller of ignorance. The light in the darkness shines and the darkness has what? Not comprehended it. So here the verbs are, I, th I believe, in the original text are being emphasized to, 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 to contrast shining and comprehending or overtaking, depending on your translation. So the word of God, the light is emphasized as shining in darkness, dispelling the darkness. The darkness here being what? Ignorance. This is spoken of metaphorically as ignorance, while the darkness isn't able to grasp its true nature and worth. And these are common themes in John, as I mentioned, light and darkness. This darkness is ultimately rooted in sin. I mean, in what sin? Rebellion against God. And how is it manifested? Well, if we look at it as a progression, if I had it on a board, I'd show you. We'd start sinful ignorance, right? I don't want to know and I don't want to know. I'm going to do my own thing. Have my own God. Have my own life, my own way, my own heaven. Maybe be. Sinful ignorance leading then to sinful practice, idolatry, immorality, all those kinds of things, and then leading to sinful dominance, dominance of one's life, right? That's the way darkness kind of, well, regresses, we might say. This darkness is also used in John euphemistically to speak of times of evil and wickedness in which evil deeds are done, enjoying the concealment that darkness allows for these things to take place. If you went to John chapter 13, verse 30, when Judas finally gives the final betrayal during the Passover supper, he leaves, and what does John add? And it was night. And it was night. Thus, Jesus' admonition and warning 
of chapter 9, verse 4 to 5. You don't have to turn there, but I want to read this to you. John chapter 9, verse 4 to 5, where the Son of God says this to his disciples upon healing a man born blind, or right beforehand. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is what? Day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then even in some of the other of John's writings, in John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, John uses it to speak not just of times of evil, but actions that characterize such times. If we say we're of the truth, but yet we walk in what? Darkness. We don't have the truth. We're lying. We're living a lie. And the thing I love about this is that this isn't like light and darkness are two equally strong opponents locked in a battle of mortal combat for the ages, okay? It's not like the Manichaeism of one of the early church errors that the early church had to deal with that, that set up light and darkness or good and evil as two opposing equally strong forces. It's not the moralistic application of the yin and the yang. You ever see that yin-yang sign? We have the white and the dark, and they're both equally the same. That gets morally applied to, well, you know, who wins out in the end? Well, if you do evil, then I guess evil wins. If you do good, then I guess good wins. If you walk in darkness, I guess darkness wins, and so on and so forth. That's not what John's talking about in here, because he says this, the darkness isn't even able to comprehend it. It's not even able to understand it. Now, once again, like I said, this is a tricky word to translate. And if you look it up in a lexicon, you'll get a bunch of different, you know, commentators, well, this, 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 and they'll bring up these different passages. Possible translations could be to make something one's own, to attain something, to grasp something with one's mind, or to take control of something. So what do I think the best option is? Well, this is what I'm going to offer. The best option is, once again, John is using a play on words to communicate, what, both options. The darkness cannot overcome the light because the light, or I'm sorry, because the darkness cannot overcome the light because truly it couldn't grasp the nature of the darkness in order to properly process and attain the true nature of life. Or light, rather. So what's the, so what's the implications here? The word can never be overcome. Darkness is limited. Darkness has no power and jurisdiction over and against the light. Just like a tiny match in a dark room, which dispels everything. Darkness may be allowed to envelop for a time, but the light will come and expose the weakness of darkness, just as the waves of the sea will eventually topple every structure of sand. And if you have any kids, you know the futility of them when they're building that sandcastle. They're just hoping that that wave doesn't get any closer, right? Try to build another boat, build a bigger boat, build a better. That thing's coming down. Okay, it's coming down eventually, right? The waves will only be held back for so long until they finally destroy that castle of sand. Just as the physical darkness over the earth was doomed to dissipation, so the light of the world has dispelled the darkness that leads men to stumble in their own sinful stupor to their own destruction. The darkness limited to encroach, but only for a time. But only for a time. We see the ignorance of darkness Just as the word created light over the watery chaos and void that was the unformed world of Genesis 1-2, so he also provides light whereby mankind comes to know what is true, contrary to the madness and chaos that is perpetrated by the darkness of sin and the ignorance it produces. And finally, and this is the best part, the victory of the light. God's light is all-encompassing and will never be snuffed out. We may be living in times that look like the light of the gospel is growing ever, ever dimmer in Western society and worldwide. But don't be fooled. A lot of times because the media likes to put only the worst news forward. Okay, so let's be fair about that. Because that's what gets them clicks and gets them money. But it can seem very dark, especially when we look at the nature and the state of the American evangelical church. We're just talking about our country. But don't be fooled. That light will never be snuffed out. And it's not measured by how many people fill your pews or how many people are willing to listen to you when you try to minister the gospel. The ministry of principle by itself produces fruit. As his word says in another place, his word will never return void. It will never come back as darkness. And in Revelation 22.5, another one of John's writings, it says, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. 
Revelation 22, 5. So in conclusion, I know I went a little long this morning. I appreciate your patience with me. We see the reigning champion of cosmology, of people who say, how did this world come into existence? Well, who's the reigning champ? Who's the undefeated one? Jesus, the word, who is the life and the light in himself, dispelling ignorance and granting life to all those who believe. Really, no question is left to the fair mind. The scriptures present God here as the word of life and light, as the sole justification for everything that ever was or ever will be. Because he lives, all things exist to bring him glory, as he is the source of whatever there is, and there ain't no more. If we're going to use that lyric, this is the ultimate reason why he made all that he made. This is our ultimate purpose for existing in this room, and he most graciously and lovingly has provided more than ample life and light to enlighten humanity to these precious truths. So to my fellow sinners in here, believers and unbelievers alike, I call upon you to do the final, final in conclusion, give this a thought. Number one, to recognize that he hasn't given you light for you to continue to fumble in the darkness. He desires for you to know the truth. How do I know that so well? Well, what else am I doing standing here going on and on and on about it? He wants you to know the truth that he is the life, that he is the light, that darkness cannot overtake him. He's the source of everything that there is. Everything comes to pass through his allowance and ordination, and nobody can stay his hand and tell him to stop. Even the demons serve him. Even the devil serves him. Everything serves him. He is not the source of evil, but he is the one that uses everything for his own glory so that nothing that happens in our lives is purposeless or meaninglessness. Everything, everything, everything has a reason. Everything does. To understand, secondly, that you truly have no excuse for your rejection of his word, either justifying the believer in disobedience or the unbeliever in foolish rejection. Recognize that. Call upon you as well to pray that the one who is the author and generator of life show you how he desires for you to glorify him in this life and whatever he lays before you to do in service to Christ and to his kingdom. And I mean that from the youngest of us to the oldest of us. Because you're never too old or too young to glorify God as long as he's sustaining your life. And finally, to repent. To repent of any known sin and continuously throw yourself upon this merciful word who is not content to allow people to fumble in the ignorance of sinful rebellion and practice, but who himself provided salvation by becoming flesh and taking on the penalty of sinners like us on the cross, bearing the full weight of punishment that sinners like us committed and deserved. So instead of the blinding light of his holiness condemning us, <laughs> it might heal and restore us, as the prophet said in promise fulfillment to Israel one day, but today for all of those who by faith in Messiah enjoy spiritually today, and that's in Isaiah chapter 60, Verse 19, where it says, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have Yahweh for an everlasting light, and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have Yahweh for an everlasting life, and the days of your mourning will be finished. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land, the branch of my plants, and the work of my hands, that I may show forth my beautiful glory. Let's pray. Lord, what great and precious truths you've presented for us in your word this morning, and I know it was a lot to take in. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for being the word through whom everything was made, and without you nothing was made that indeed is in existence. That you are the generator of life. You are the source of it. And in your life, was the light of all of us. The light that enlightened us and showed us that we were not just animals who, were, who have no intrinsic value or worth that are, just, that are just here and then gone tomorrow with no eternal soul, but that we are indeed made in your image and that you desired to communicate to us the gospel of grace and awakened our hearts and minds to receive it. We know many who, who do not do so. 
And for all we know, Lord, you may have ordained not to waken them out of their spiritual stupor. But we're no better than they are, Lord. We were fumbling in the darkness as well, and you would have been right to leave us in that darkness to our own devices. And yet the light that you sent not only enlightened us to our sinful condition, not only enlightened us to the fact that we were dependent upon you for every last thing, but also showed us the light of the Savior. And we saw that light through his his nail-pierced hands and through the hole in his side. And you gave us new life in him so that the darkness of this world, of our past sins, of the sin and evil of others to encroach upon us, although you may allow it to persist for a time, we know it will never, ever have the final word. That light will never, ever be snuffed out. And we praise you and thank you for that. May you bless your word this morning. May you bless it to the hearts of all those who were able to hear. And I ask for your name to be continuously honored and magnified in all we do this week. We ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen.